And Christoph, I was uh, just killing time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've already done the honors and introduced you. So we are looking forward to hearing more about you and your time um, in, the, in the, the, the Nordic banks. And now that you're sort of spreading your wings into the big fascinating world of open banking. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. I just had to press the button a hundred times and then I was in. So let me just pull up my presentation and I will share with you uh, my experience uh, when it comes to open banking. And like I said, from vision to execution, uh, my experience is from reading about open banking uh, to actually deploying open banking solutions in a bank. So let me see if you have my window here now and I'll pull up uh, the full screen. So first of all, uh, I would like to give some pointers about uh, the banking landscape uh, in the Nordics, uh, since um, you already mentioned there's exciting stuff going on here. Uh, and there's a reason why uh, the Nordics is uh, a breeding ground for a lot of uh, fintech and uh, digital banking innovations. Um, the digital infrastructure uh, is one of the best in the world. Uh, we are constantly on the top of the list when it comes to smartphone penetration and high-speed internet. But um, I, one of the main ingredients is that we have high levels of trust uh, within uh, the society and people actually trust uh, the Nordic banks. Uh, this sets us apart from a lot of other countries where the trust in the banking um, uh, industry is not that high. Um, and consumers are early adopters of digital services. So. With this backdrop, uh, why should we even bother to innovate? Uh, shouldn't we just think that, well, we are kings of the world already, so let's let all the other banks get disrupted. After all, Norwegian banks, we have been on the internet since 1994. The first European online bank was uh, launched uh, here in Norway. <clears throat> However, if you look back at history, we can look at how the online banking solutions look like in uh, the year 2000. And if we fast forward 20 years, we see that really not that much have changed in terms of customer interface and customer interaction. And if we rewind our brains even further back, uh, this all reminds us of the good old paper-based account statement that we once received in the mail uh, once a month. So. We have been world champions at um, digitizing the back end, uh, making banking uh, streamlined and efficient, but there's still so much more to do when it comes to front end innovation, when it comes to customer interaction and so forth. And this is what we are facing. Uh, I, I like to call this a perfect storm of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, trends and drivers that is shaping the industry. We have the regulatory changes, uh, um, PSD2 uh, is probably one of the subjects that many will mention today. It's been the catalyst for many of the <clears throat> open banking initiatives within uh, across Europe. We're seeing um, a lot of new business models emerging. Uh, you look at um, crowd lending, crowdfunding, and so forth. Uh, different startups are testing the waters on how to redefine banking. But also we see that yesterday's uh, customers and partners are not necessarily uh, content with just being um, banking customers. They are uh, attempting to enter the banking uh, <clears throat> banking stage and especially within the payment stage themselves. Uh, the big technology companies, uh, this has been uh, a looming threat uh, ever since I went into banking um, almost eight years ago. But at the end of the day, it is the consumer and customer behavior that is uh, shaping things going forward. Technology in this uh, in this equation is only the enabling factor that uh, allows banks to think differently, but also allows non-banks to think differently and uh, um, try out different attack vectors uh, on what is a highly regulated industry. But this should not be necessary to say, but we see that the future is, is mobile. Uh, it is the smartphone, uh, which is dominating uh, user interactions. Uh, from my previous employments, we saw that 70 to 80% of all customer interactions during the day was on the mobile phone. Uh, this poses some um, uh, 
uh, challenges for uh, banks that have been early adopters on uh, being online because um, the traditional online bank on the web browser might uh, uh, suffer the same fate as uh, the branches as people are now abandoning the web-based interfaces uh, towards towards mobile. And thus, we are seeing a lot of banks are launching a lot of apps. There's a lot of personal finance apps, a lot of uh, savings apps. But for, from my perspective, launching an app does not make you digital. It is what lies below the surface that really, uh, that's, that's where the magic, magic happens. Uh, and there's many technologies that have been... Um, <clears throat> um, that has been uh, said to challenge banking, to transform banking. Uh, we have talked about blockchain that was uh, said to uh, replace banking. After all, um, we're still seeing the banks are there. There's no magical technology that are replacing the banks uh, overnight. AI has major implications, both in terms of threats, but also in terms of uh, uh, opportunities, but it's still early days. But what are the technologies that's proven technologies that has been around since forever? It's the use of APIs. Uh, when I first took office as CDO uh, four years ago, I, I promised the entire C-level management suite that uh, you guys have to understand uh, what those three letters mean in a business context. This should not longer. This this should no longer be an abbreviation that is uh, limited to the IT department. We need to really understand this because everybody is talking about uh, data is the new oil. Uh, I would like to say if data is the new oil, APIs are the pipelines that really uh, enables uh, companies to make use of APIs. Uh, and you see a lot of banks are really experimenting and leveraging APIs for, um, for their benefits. Um, the availability of open APIs out there uh, is a constant evolving source of innovation. This graph is a bit old, so I guess this is way, way up since I composed this uh, uh, overview of uh, available financial APIs as programmable web. I, I did this for when we started exploring and actually executing on our open banking uh, strategy. And whether you are looking to uh, consume APIs or expose your APIs, uh, there are many opportunities out there. And that's what I would like to go into now. How, how do we take this uh, vision uh, from uh, PowerPoints and presentations um, to actually execution? And to, to really comprehend that, I, I like to um, contextualize how an open API platform actually works. And everybody has uh, a relationship with, with Facebook. Uh, and acknowledging how Facebook has built their digital ecosystem shows the true potential of, of APIs. Um, we are saying constantly that Facebook is no longer the cool thing among the young. They're not using it anymore. Even though people are not using Facebook like they did, Facebook has become the operating system for the digital social life for many of their users. And they have done it through a clever use of open APIs. Whether it is their own suite of uh, uh, customer-facing applications like Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and so forth, uh, you see here that I'm getting kind of old because there's a, it's been a while since Instagram used that uh, that logo, but also how they enable third-party community to actually connect to to their platform and launch uh, services like, for instance, Farmville, which many of us remember to getting a lot of invitation to uh, back in the days. But uh, the most powerful integrations are the ones that leverage the Facebook identity. And I, I would like to share with you how Spotify's Facebook integration really, really exemplifies uh, how Facebook is building stickiness in their platform through APIs, open APIs. This has been an inspiration for our work with APIs. Looking how um, when you connect with, uh, with Facebook to Spotify, they gain access to uh, your friend list, uh, what you're listening to, 
um, they're, be, they're able to build a profile. And at the same time, you're giving this away to Facebook, but you're able to then look at what music your friends are listening to, get collaborative playlists. So it's, uh, an, uh, it's an exchange of data that provides value for me as an end user. And of course, Facebook will use this to target ads and so forth towards me, but it's valuable for me and it makes me hard to quit the platform since things are getting entangled. And for banks, especially, um, looking for uh, various ways to uh, uh, to employ churn, churn uh, reduction. APIs and uh, social connections are powerful tools to really create customer stickiness. But in order to do that, th there are some tricks up, up, um, up our sleeves that uh, we really wanted to copy. One of them, uh, like we looked at Facebook for inspiration, Another example that I'm, I'm really impressed by is, uh, is Stripe. Stripe has deployed something I like to call developer friendliness as a competitive advantage. Stripe as a payment solution is really not the cheapest one out there, but their APIs are so well documented, it's so easy to start using Stripe that um, if you want to get a payment solutions up and running, it is the fastest choice out there. And they have really built a strategy around developer friendliness. So if APIs should be one of your uh, go-to-market strategies, make sure external developers really want to use your solutions. Going from there, um, Getting the business model right, um, we oh, we were we were listening to a business model as one of the key goals uh, before the break here, and really knowing what business model is suitable for your business. Uh, as a bank, it's kind of difficult. Uh, we're not since it's, just, it's a regulated industry, it's not that simple to just put our APIs out there and start doing a freemium model. You are mandated to do know your customer checks and so forth. But there are various models that you can have either charge by call, transaction-based is obviously a model that's suitable for banks. Um, but also, as I say, balance sheet uh, is one of the powerful uh, opportunities that you have um, when you are looking at banking as a service. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, Perhaps the, the thing that you are interested in as a bank is to be the originator of loans or be uh, wherever people place their deposits and give up uh, your the customer interface. Uh, when you're looking at banks versus um, ERP and accounting systems, we, look, we see that accountants, they really want to use their accounting system, not the online bank. But as long as their funds stay in the bank account at the bank, at hand. Perhaps it doesn't matter that much if uh, the accountant use the accounting system and do not long, no longer use the online bank. But taking this from vision to execution, uh, it's important to have a good API architecture, uh, 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 a, a digital identity and a customer profile is core to building a good API platform. Um, knowing what you what to do with your data, uh, both your internal data, but also external data. Uh, having a good sense of which internal products and services should be exposed to third parties, uh, as well as having a good uh, a sense of which third party products and services you are willing to expose to your customers. There are uh, many, many pathways to choose in this uh, image. Uh, Drawing up a decision map uh, and acknowledging that there's really no silver bullet to how to compose this. Uh, you, you need to find out which uh, combinations are fit for purpose for your end goals and your strategies. Perhaps you are just going to be an API only bank. Uh, we are seeing some banks uh, here in Norway that are really not making their apps at all. They're only being available through APIs. I think that's an interesting move. Uh, even more interesting than 
for instance, Virgin, which is closing their online bank and only being an app only bank. I think the boldest banks are those who dare to be an API only bank. And that, that is one of the fundamental choices on which role you want to take. Uh, do you want to be the front and center and integrate data and services, owning the customer relationship? Uh, or are you going to build the platform that others can build on top of your balance sheet, uh, your products, your services? It's a fundamental choice when it comes to uh, setting up a position as an open banking provider and or, or as a banking as a service uh, player. But one of the most important parts when you are really getting from the shallow shores over to the deep end of open banking is managing operational risk. When opening up APIs, you are willingly uh, increasing the number of attack vectors on uh, your digital platform. So being able to have uh, cybersecurity at the front of everything you do when you're venturing into API territory, it's crucial. And that's, uh, I used to say, and I also still used to say, this is the entry ticket to being able to play. Having uh, a platform security that, uh, migrates away from the old-fashioned firewall approach to having security embedded within the code, building a zero trust environment, uh, being uh, constantly paranoid and thinking like a crook in development, asking yourself constantly, how can somebody use this for malicious purposes? Building this uh, within your governance structure towards vendor management, uh, following up your IT system providers with uh, rigorous uh, reviews that are uh, suited for an open API uh, IT architecture uh, as opposed to a siloed approach, which, which banks are used to. Uh, but on the right-hand side, um, uh, the human factor is the most important part, both in terms of uh, the organization that you are uh, um, representing, uh, managing operational risk in terms of keeping uh, your talent in-house and actually having uh, continuity plans for critical pers personnel, but also when it comes to awareness. Human errors is the primary source of incidents. So being able to mitigate that through constant learning within the organization not only on the uh, in within it organization it's crucial but that's one of the hardest parts because it's hard enough to create uh, engagement and understanding around apis as an abbreviation but when you are also putting on demands of api security things get uh, more difficult to evangelize internally, especially on the business side. But as you go ahead and start doing integration, seeing is believing is a powerful tool. Our first integration was uh, integrating Coinbase. Uh, we did that back in 2017. Uh, the timing was impeccable. We got a lot of attention since Bitcoin was back then really, really uh, growing uh, in terms of value. But we never did it because of the Bitcoin or the crypto part. We did it because Coinbase, they have good developer friendliness. Uh, it took us a very few hours to integrate um, Coinbase uh, basically as an iframe in our front end solutions. It was not that elegant in the front end, but it proved that our API platform were up to the task. And going from there, we added more integrations from uh, the National Student Loan Registry, uh, PSD2 data before PSD2 went live, uh, also from various startups. Uh, we launched a developer portal where our customers were able to make their own, um, uh, own uh, banking applications. There's a lot of fun stuff being developed there. It was a true source of innovation and inspiration for the company. It, it really created engagement uh, way long outside of the IT department. And it gave us uh, the necessary um, momentum in the organization to go forward with then ex uh, integrating to external services like uh, uh, P2P payment platform, VIPs, but also accounting system for the SME banking uh, uh, suite. And my, uh, to say, uh, my, my best advice here is to, find somewhere to start. We started with Coinbase uh, 
We saw that USAA had did it before. We looked at the APIs. Uh, Coinbase was reg regulated in the US. It was a safe bet to start. Uh, there are probably other, other places to start, but going quickly from drawing up uh, a vision to actually implementing something, it really gets things rolling at a much faster pace. And involve the customers at an early stage. Uh, we tested out a lot of things, like I mentioned Coinbase. It was uh, uh, it was pulled from the online bank. Not that many customers used it. Uh, those who used it loved it. Uh, you'll see the piggy bank there. That's somebody who's made um, a real-time view of their uh, current account. Uh, they ordered some parts online, bought a pig at a local toy store, and put in the display into it. Uh, we have categorization of spending on the right side, and also you had the new mobile bank, which is internal APIs, but we're using the same platform. And at, at the end, this should reach end customers, and you got to keep it simple, uh, especially if you are a bank. I think most of you can recognize uh, what you see on the right-hand side here when you are building banking applications. Uh, there's always something new to add to that. There's always some, some new integrations. And that is why we have pulled some of our pilot integrations. Uh, we see that 40% of all features in all software is never used. And it's all about keeping it simple. That is the key to creating products that people love. And many of the best API integrations are the ones that is invisible for the customers that all only exist in the background to make things as easy as possible in the front. So thank you very much. Hello, um, sorry for the slight delay there. Christopher, thank you very much. Wow, so much. Um, we are recording these sessions, so everybody can go back and uh, re, re look at that and review that that insight that you shared. Now, um, I we we have got um, we haven't got any questions from um, in the chat, um, but I do have a a few if if that's okay. Um, I think everybody's being a little bit shy, so if I could encourage you just to to engage and and just jot, jot down your questions, it really is a good opportunity. To, to talk to these panels of experts. Uh, Christoph, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Open Banking Excellence, this amazing global community uh, for open banking pioneers. And we had a, a session recently about premium APIs. I would love to know more about your view on premium APIs and whether you think they're a game changer. Well, it depends. Um, for, from a banking perspective, uh, it's uh, important to divide between um, consumer market uh, and SME and business market. Uh, mm -hmm. For the business side, the uh, premium APIs, of course, it's uh, a source of revenues. Uh, I'm using them myself now uh, as a customer of S-Banken, uh, integrating my, uh, my open banking platform that I helped build myself to my accounting system to get real-time uh, data feed between my accounting system and, uh, and, my, uh, and my bank. And as a, uh, as a customer, I gladly pay for those premium APIs. So uh, I believe I look at myself as a living proof that this has something uh, of value for me as a customer. But uh, I think it's important to really uh, see that uh, the business model that you are attempting to deploy is fit for purpose and serves a true value. Brilliant. So they are making a, a, a difference and you're using them yourself. I do have one final question. Obviously, open banking is now transitioning into open finance. And the chat that we had backstage, you said it should be called open up. Where where do you see um, your, your journey with open finance going? Uh, well, my journey, it depends on uh, the, the clients that engage me as an advisor. But uh, as as we moved from um, fr from the drawing board to to execution, uh, I, I think th there will be many realizations along the way. Uh, we have tested out. I have shown you some of the uh, deployments that were actually implemented, but there were also many uh, attempts that we figured out along the way that was a lot harder in um, 
uh, in reality that it was uh, in theory. And that's mainly due to, uh, to the fact that the banks are so heavily regulated. So many of the perhaps obvious API plays from a more creative perspective is extremely difficult to, um, to actually implement. Uh, this is due to uh, the, that the banks will, at the end of the day, be the bearer of risk of many things on the operational risk, on the KYC and AML risk, uh, on credit risk, uh, and so forth, fraud risk. So just to mention a few, it will be at the bank side. And when you look at the burden of actually integrating too many, I think there are tremendously uh, exciting opportunities within open banking, but I believe that there will be more one more one to one integrations than what we saw in the beginning. Many were uh, thinking about being an API marketplace for many many fintechs. Then you need to have uh, really strict governance in place for every single one of your integration partners. Uh, and if, if looking at it at from a cybersecurity perspective. Many of the biggest breaches in, uh, uh, in, in, in um, for instance, Instagram has been due to poor API security. It's a, it's an API security, is something you touched on before with that fabulous uh, pink piggy bank. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Christopher, my job is to keep this track on time. So um, if I could just say thank you for, for um, sharing your insight, your presentation and this recording, um, everybody can download and, and see again. Um, I personally have a, I, I'm a keen cyclist, so at the weekend I go out on my, um, sit on my turbo train and I, that's when I do all my catching up. And I will be, uh, advise everybody to, to, to re-watch what you've just shared, stumbling over my words there. Thank you very, very much and good luck with your, your next chapter. And, and life as a consultant. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. You're very, very welcome.